Neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and B.B. King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show. With your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcelino. Well, good day to you, Mr. Good Bober. Day to you, Mr. Marcelino. Oh, it how, is how a be beautiful. You? How be you? A uh, uh, little, little groggy. Groggy. A okay. little groggy. All right. Yeah. Well. You know, slam down that monster drink and let's go. <laughs> yeah, you it's know, time I, to uh, turn it up to 11. That's it. <laughs> goes to 11 and of course we got to start by thanking all of you guys for listening thank you so much man yes we appreciate it you're spreading the word the word is getting out everything is looking good the uh, like i said we're, we're turning it up to 11 mm-hmm. uh you guys are clicking on the amazon banner thank you very much through amps and access that's right make sure you go to all the social media definitely the instagram follow us on instagram and you'll see pictures every day from me and then they all trickle down to our Facebook page, and mm-hmm. that's Amps and Axis. And, uh, of course, the one guy that works harder than all of us here. Mr. Jason. Mr. Jason Sadias with the quick lick. The guy just... And he, and he's Keeps like, him, talk about keeping him coming. Yeah, he's Jesus. like, hey, I'm going to be uh, going here and going here. I'm not going to be here for a couple weeks, so here's two more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like... I feel like we should be sending him a check. It's like, I got a life, but I recorded these for you anyway. You know, thank you very much, Jason. Yeah, man. uh, And, you know, he's out there. He's reposting all of our stuff. How can you? There's nothing wrong with that guy. (laughs) No, it's it's, it's, we have a very reciprocal uh, uh, relationship. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I I hope so anyway. So, yeah. Thank you. And we hope you guys enjoy him. Yeah. Now, when you hear this, this will be a little bit old. But uh, the one thing that I saw the other day, man, it just blew my mind uh, was. uh, Well, it's still probably being worked on. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, yeah, absolutely. Jesus. Um, Was when Dave Grohl fell off the edge of the stage. Wow. And broke his leg. And then did the show from a chair or a stretcher or sitting down in, yeah. a, in a chair or something with yeah. his leg wrapped up and, and elevated. Yeah. I, and Dave Grohl, I think is one of those. Now, Pat, Pap smear, Pat Pap, smear. Pap, yeah. Not Pap smear. <laughs> Pat smear. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm going home now. <laughs> um, he, they're very down to earth. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are, uh, Adam Carolla goes over Pat's house all the time. They're like friends and they hang out together. Cool. And he said, this guy is like, just like, hey, you want to, you know, just and I know it's Adam Carolla. It's, you know, right. it's rich guy. But he said he's just like this normal guy. He doesn't like flaunt anything. He doesn't make a big deal out of it or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and for that to happen and him to get up there and do that. I mean, I know they were probably trying to avoid a riot, mm-hmm. but the guy broke his leg and uh, doing what he does all the time, which is uh, run around like a maniac. True, true. I mean, at fifty, right? <laughs> That's right. what you can't do. Well, he, you know, he did say he can still play guitar and still scream. Sure. You know? So, but he, here's my thing. Uh-huh. And this is real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, all the technology we have, and now it was outside and it was still light. He tripped mm-hmm. and fell off the stage. Um, seriously, they can't put. Uh, a net that goes out six feet and that perimeters that because a lot of times it's black black stage Mm -hmm. everything's black the hole you're going to fall into is black and uh you know they they have the audience now far enough away that if they did just bring out a net that's like six feet or whatever. That's, that's, that's a good idea. You know, they, they you, do you, tend to keep the audiences away from directly absolutely. in front of the stage. Yeah, there, stage, there's a know? barrier now, and there's a there's some guy in a yellow windbreaker that says security. It's big right. as a house between you and the stage. So why couldn't they just do that? 
and uh, you know because Steven Tyler you know he took a spill mm -hmm. and uh, of course you know Dave and God knows how many other people we've seen just this year yeah you know that's that's probably a good idea that, that's yeah. I would think if I was in that kind of position part of the stage design would be well I need to six foot net all the way around because yeah. I never know if I'm going to take a header <laughs> 20 feet down to the well, concrete. you know, that's that's Dave trying to get close to the fans, as close as possible to the fans. <laughs> he was and trying to shoot himself out into the audience. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Did you see the x-ray? Oh, I have not God. seen the x-ray, no. It, it's, it's not just a tiny little, oh, these two little bones have a little crack between yeah, it's them. It's a separation. It's a separation, yeah. you know. It's funny, I, I saw something where he, halfway through the set when he's sitting down, his doctor comes up on stage and says, can I get you anything? And he says, yes, whiskey. <laughs> 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 you know the show must go on yeah and the drunker i get the better it gets you know? <laughs> so yeah I don't, I don't know god god bless april that's all i gotta say that's all i gotta say think about that career that's yeah he was in nirvana as a drummer mm -hmm. and then takes and turns around and makes the foo just, fighters just records this thing at home and just explodes yeah that's, that's i mean that is the American dream as best as it gets. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Well, speaking of exploding, we have a kind of an explosive player today. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I don't want to use the word explosive, but I will absolutely use the word percussive mm. in describing his playing. It's a very unique style, but you know, he, he's, he's done a lot, you know, he's, mm -hmm. he's been around for a while and he's, um, uh, he's got a degree from uh, UC Berkeley he uh, he toured with uh, Jerry Garcia band for a while. Uh, actually, editor and guitar player. Uh, <laughs> played that 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 three bass tour the BX3. thing, the BX3, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, MIT the, the director at MIT. I mean, let's you know, let's not forget that. And and you know, um, G uh, plays guitar for Jefferson Starship. I mean, you know, uh, just a. a, a <laughs> A varied career. It's like Prego. It's all in there. It's all in there. It's, yeah, man. <laughs> it's all in there, and a very, very unique style. You, you'll uh, once once you go search him out, you'll go, wow. That's um, yeah. I don't, I don't know anybody else that really plays guitar that way. So uh, no. you know, it's a uh, it's very unique, and um, we're happy to have him on the show. So we're going to take a quick break, and as soon as we come back, uh, we will have with us our guest of the week, Mr. Jude Gold. <laughs> Hey, this is Chris Broderick of Act of Defiance, and you are listening to Amps and Axes. All right, we're back, and as promised, our guest for the week, Mr. Jude Gold. Jude, how are you, my friend? Oh, great, man. Thanks for having me. I've actually been, uh, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I've been really digging your podcast. It's really cool. You have a uh, cool artist on there, like Rick Derringer and stuff. That was killer. Cool. And then awesome. I love all the gear stuff, too, like Richie Fliegler, he's guy I've always been curious about, never really got to know him personally, to hear the two separate episodes of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Richie's a good guy, man. Richie is a good yeah. guy. It's a I long like story, so you have to do it over two episodes. Yeah. yeah. Now, now the one that you'll really find crazy is the Joe Barden story. That's five. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's five episodes. Yeah, we, we called that um, Podcast Sweeps Week yes. because we got five episodes out of it. So we just, you know, it's it's the entire Joe Barden story if anybody is interested and knows yeah. about his pickups and it's it's really in depth. It's very very cool. Yeah, he doesn't really. Um, he never really even held back either. He he went. Yeah. You know, he let us in on some yeah. stuff that probably well, absolutely has not been discussed. Yeah, it's, since it's, he it's very lost cool. the company and all. So. And now it's archived in what? Perpetuity. Yeah. Perpetuity. Don't That's do right. that to me, man. I'm working a four hour sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I should. It's, it's just such a great thing because like. Back in the day, Guitar Player Magazine was where you went if you wanted the hardcore information. And now, of course, we have the whole internet. But these deep interviews that you can find on podcasts, such as you guys interviewing these cats or Andy Fuchs, all about amp building. And, you know, it's really amazing to get in there. And that's how you really learn stuff, you know. It's yeah. Really well, th thanks for uh, yeah, knowing man. about it and actually listening to it. I mean, I could tell you're a fan. So thank you very much. That is so cool. Really appreciate it. <laughs> There are two kinds of people in the world, people who listen to podcasts and people who haven't discovered how cool they are yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a different like, world. Yeah. If you have any time to yourself, like if you're doing chores or for me, I, I hike this canyon behind my house pretty much every day for my little excuse for exercise. <laughs> oh, nice. And, you know, it's always good to have a podcast on there. So 
Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, yeah. It's, I guess it's okay if you're driving too, as long as it's not too loud and distracting. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know? I listen to like, I don't know, I got like eight or nine. You know, or if you have some here. sort of uh, mindless job that you have to do, you know. And, <laughs> that you're up not, until 3.30 in the morning. Not dissing anybody's job, but you know, if, if there's something where you need a distraction, we would love to be your distraction. So there you go. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, you know, it's like a, heart surgeon or something it's good to have a podcast going <laughs> <laughs> hey sometimes those guys got acdc going man so oh, yeah. you know who knows <laughs> who knows totally. you know I, I want a heart transplant by a doctor who's listening to acdc when it happens man that's yeah. what i want <laughs> i don't know if i want the guy that's listening to my nasally drone <laughs> <laughs> it's true Working on well my you heart. know what enough right. about us this is all yes. about jude absolutely so, hey let's do what i always do and Hit the Wayback Machine. Yes. And Jude, we always like to find out about the person that's on the other end of this uh, this electronic wonder here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about where Jude Gold came from and uh, what infected you with the music bug and, and where did it start? So give us a little background, man. Oh, man, that's super easy. For me, there are definitely two, two halves of my life before I got into music and afterwards. <laughs> I always loved music. You know, I grew up in Berkeley, Oakland, California. My dad would play me folk songs and Bob Dylan and stuff. And, you know, by, we'd listen to albums like soundtracks to Wizard of Oz. And I, I mean, I always loved the Star Wars music. But, you know, I had a friend when I was like eight years old. Sometimes this is like the Carter administration or something, right? Late 70s. Mm -hmm. And she was kind of a tomboy. And we'd play outside and do all the stuff. But she also had like that girly quality of being into pop artists and stuff. And she's literally, we're, we're all going outside to play. She's like, no, I got to find this song on the radio. And she mentions the name of this artist. And to me, it sounds like David Cassidy or Leif Garrett or something like, like, I'm what, what do you, why, what? No, <laughs> but she's, she's literally cruising the dial and then boom, she actually finds the song she's looking for. Michael Jackson, shake your body down to the ground. Uh, and, wow. and I couldn't believe it was like a lightning bolt went through me. The, funky pocket of the drums and the bass and then his electric vocals you know she keep it down to the ground like the way his every syllable was perfectly in time it was like it's like oh i get it now now i see what all the fuss is about <laughs> you know well, was, I was, was by, that was that q at that time was he producing yeah i think that might have been first quincy jones kind of era stuff probably which is the funkiest stuff ever man if you listen to that quincy jones stuff oh yeah band the members on that, those those tracks are just so like you know don't stop till you get enough mm -hmm. i've obsessed over like the little parts on the end of that song <laughs> like it's like these funky like marcus henderson is on there or this guitar player i'm not even sure i found him on other records too like patrice russian just super funky studio cat mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i didn't know any of that back then i just knew that it just sounded good the louder you played it it was unbelievable so that's, that's when i really I got the bug. You know, I think I was playing acoustic guitar at that time. Before that, I had started on piano, but that was a great tragedy. Like the third <laughs> third lesson, the piano teacher came over to the house. I think afterwards, he just looked like he was going to cry, and he was just kind of like, yeah, <laughs> no, to my mom, you know. He's like, that's not going to work. He's trying to play with his toes. <laughs> it's like, this and then my, work. my next failure was that I remember they used to play reruns of The Odd Couple, and I wanted to play the theme of that. So that. naturally, I bought a clarinet. Now, if anyone remembers that, I think it's it's a saxophone. So that was a total fail, you know. <laughs> Whatever it was. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> we, used to, we used to have like a jam. Like we had one. That was my first jam session. All the kids in the apartment building. We all got out our little instruments. There were like two or three of us, and we're out in the courtyard, just making horrible noise. You know, probably. <laughs> good to like ornette coleman rest his soul or something but like it was like really random sounds and then i came back out like a half hour later to see if anyone was out and i had my clarinet and i was playing the three notes i knew how to play and the, and the lady upstairs my friend's mom she said we're all done with that now you need to put that away <laughs> so, so that's what i did but i then i picked up the acoustic guitar and i still have this wonderful takamini it's like an orchestra model martin copy it's perfect oh talks are nice man yeah. Yeah, this yeah. thing plays great. This is my mom's guitar and she gave it to me when I was seven or eight. And I was doing that. And okay, to get to the point here though, I had a friend named Freddie and he always knew he was older than me on the schoolyard and he always knew what the number one songs were. Uh, I was all 
hey, Freddy, what's number one this week? And he's all, it's Boogie Nights. Boogie Night. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I picked it up, and sure enough, it was a great jam, but I couldn't tell if there was much guitar on it or not. There's, it turns out I think there was, but he had like an envelope filter, so I kind of thought it was like a synthesizer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then, a couple weeks later... So you're, 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 let, me, let me stop you right there. You're picking up all this stuff by ear at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. Because you only I mean, have you know, a, a few stuff. piano I've lessons. Teacher stuff too, you know. I I could list a long, long list of teachers. No, oh. mm. okay. <laughs> I believe heavily in in just. I mean, I also believe that we're all self taught anyway. Whether you learn from your friends or from records or from teachers, it's all these are all things you're consulting, and then you're teaching yourself with the information you get. Whether it's from someone who sits down in an official capacity or. A like class that. take or a YouTube video. It's all what you do with it. So that, that's a very new way to look at it. I yeah, like that. I, yeah. I really like that. You know, you know. It, uh, also, too, uh, you're the first guy that we've had on here that uh, referenced Michael Jackson as like you know oh. the, the 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 light. Yeah, it's yeah. usually you know the Beatles or you know a lot of Beatles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely a lot of. <laughs> but Beatles. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, that's pretty neat because you know, I my kids they they listen to ABC. Okay. by the jackson five right mm -hmm. have yeah. you heard the bass line in that song <laughs> that is an it's incredible so bass line in that song i mean well, they, it, those tunes are great like my friend john mark he he showed me he plays all he teaches lessons all the time he plays like the other one <laughs> that's cool wow. it's just so much fun to play that stuff you know? <laughs> that's well, awesome who needs a bass player yeah. you know <laughs> oh yeah, but you know, but then so okay, so then the following a little while later, my friend Freddie Debose. I wonder where he's at. He's probably around somewhere. I live in L.A. now, but he's he's still probably up in the Bay Area. I don't know. <laughs> he says, "Oh, it's Freak Out by Chic, or it's called Le Freak Says Chic by Le Chic." Freak. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, hmm, I gotta pick that up. So I like went down to this drugstore, or whatever, four ninety nine or something, vinyl. Awesome. If you know the, you everybody knows that song, right? Oh, oh that's that's Nile oh, Rodgers, man. Yeah. 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 And, uh, of course, the original lyrics apparently were, aw, fuck you, when they couldn't get into Studio 54 one night. And then they were like, this is a cool jam. Let's change this to something we can actually sell to the radio. Wow. <laughs> I, I had heard that before that somewhere. It was like a pissed off, you know, they went and they yeah. wrote it pissed off when they couldn't get in one night. And <laughs> it, was, it was so good they had to just make it commercial. You know, th th it's so funny that you say that. Uh, there's another song, uh, Wonderful Tonight, uh, the Eric Clapton song. Yeah. It was not a song that he supposedly wrote to his uh, wife at the time uh, that she was wonderful. Mm -hmm. He was pissed off. She was taken forever to get dressed and get ready. And it was kind of a <laughs> condescending thing. Oh, like it, was, it was written in, in a sarcastic? Yeah. Like, well, oh, you look well. wonderful tonight, you know? <laughs> About time. <laughs> yeah. He's like, babe, you look just fine tonight. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's like, I'm glad. That could have been worse. I thought you were going to say it was originally for his uh, mistress or something. Yeah. Not that he ever had one. I'm not saying he did. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, they, all, they all at one point just traded wives. I was going to say, that was, that was Harrison's wife, wasn't it? it? Uh, uh, prior wife. Patty Boyd yeah. Harrison yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they, just they, they all a know. laundry list uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what you did you know <laughs> but yeah, let's so get back to what Jude yes does. I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so uh where were we of uh, uh, you you're playing with your friends in the courtyard that this must stop uh, <laughs> <laughs> so when did it start up again when did when did you go okay we all know enough that we could make uh, beautiful music together you know what 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 came next well you know for me it was uh it was i got the acoustic guitar and you know i always tell people too like the hardest part of playing guitar is that first three months when you're just you just you just like you can't even walk you're like a baby who can't even lift his head or roll over let alone walk it's really frustrating plus it's painful on your fingers mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I was, you know, I think I learned some, but I couldn't play it really, it sounded horrible. And But then, like I was saying, Nile Rodgers came along and boom, I'm like, I got to get an electric guitar. So I was hooked on electric. You know, it's funny, I finally, uh, one of my favorite moments was interviewing my first guitar hero, Nile Rodgers. I interviewed him at his office oh. in New York City. You know, he's got some foundations and all these different... He's a businessman in addition to me and the great producer. He's completely blown up with Daft Punk, you know, the Get Lucky song. Oh, and, yeah. 
all this stuff, which is so exciting for me to see. It's like, it's like I told you so. It's like after all these years, it just holds up that sound. But, mm-hmm. but it was interesting talking to him because he was like, you know how many times I go to clubs or bars, I see somebody playing one of my songs like Freak Out or La Freak, and they're playing it so wrong. And I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? How yeah. hard is it to play it, you know? I'm purposely playing it how he does not play it. <laughs> how he, he kind of think, and I think if I understood him correctly, what he said is how he plays his stuff is more like in smaller groups of strings, so the pick kind of gets a little more of a flam. Yeah, he. I've I've seen interviews where he plays no more than two or three strings. And yeah, yeah, cool. and he, yeah. Exactly. You get that little flam, and he's like, he's like, I see these guys. I'm like, do you seriously think that's how I play that tune? Like, like all six strings all the time? No, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. It's not. Which there's nothing wrong with playing that way either. That's kind of the more of the aggressive funk, almost Chili Peppers kind of approach. So I'm like, I'm a believer in knowing all the extremes like on whether it's loud or soft what you know dynamics like one dynamic would be to hit all the six strings and the other would be other end of the spectrum would to be a play like Nile. anyway yeah, I, it's, I, and I, the thing about him is it's like it's still the same sound it's still the same technique you know it's still the same freaking guitar you know yeah. it's it's yeah. it's Nile since Le Chic it's been exactly the same and now it's blown up with Daft Punk again you know <laughs> it's exactly the same and it's there's it's a strat Pro, uh, with with compression and probably straight into the board. Well, there you go. And that's it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a great sound. He's done so many just incredibly funky licks over the years, too, producing Madonna and David Bowie, Diana Ross, all that stuff. You know? Yeah. I just yeah. love it. Wild stuff, so, man. Totally. So so when, when did you start funking out with the first band? And what's your first band of funk band? <laughs> My first band was more of a prog, maybe. Wow. Mm. A great drummer who went on to form a great bunk, great um, funk band called Fungo Mungo. They eventually got signed to Island. They're just great. Jeff Gomes, my first uh-huh. drummer. But, you know, my first guitar, like my mom was like, okay, we're going to get you a guitar. And we went to Subway Guitars in Berkeley, California. And I'm just looking at the walls and I'm going like, someday I'm going to have a job and I can buy any one of these guitars, maybe two or three of them. <laughs> and they were all just like pawn shop, like kind of like, Tysco guitars, like with six pickups and like eight switches, and you know, to me, the more was better. Oh, I had one of those. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't really afford one of those, so I got a Harmony Stratotone. That looks kind of like a Les Paul shape, but it's like made of like plywood and like mm. uh, semi hollow. Mm-hmm. And I, I eventually destroyed it in my first photo shoot with my brother. We like <laughs> we smashed it and did some photos, which was like that was in high school, oh my which gosh. I kind of regret because it'd be cool to have it around. <laughs> for sure say, be great for slide as they say ha 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 <laughs> <laughs> i had a i had a memphis amp it had like a two inch speaker on it it was and i was always wondering how do people get distortion and finally i figured out you figured it out you just turn the amp up really loud but then i got my first real tone lesson when my cousin came over we we all used to go to casadero music camp great music camp in berkeley oh. and he came through with a gibson sg and a crate you know those old crates out of 60 watt solid state 12 inch speaker and it literally looked like a crate of wood it looked like we yeah. had somebody else brought this up it looked like this end up furniture yeah 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 exactly just wood mm-hmm. tons <laughs> of distortion man and oh yeah just, he busts out some acdc <laughs> you know and he goes in the double time section I mean, it was like mind boggling to me. It's like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> so then, you know, I understood humbuckers and I understood distortion. It was a whole major breakthrough. I had, I had a few of those kind of major breakthrough moments. Wow. <laughs> he must have been your hero at that point. <laughs> he was. Yeah. He showed me all these tunes and, uh, yeah, it was great. And then I think my next breakthrough moment was that you could have the most crappy guitar in the world. Like we, and it could sound great. And we used to have jazz lab band at Berkeley High School. And, you know, you play like Chameleon and Billy's Bounce and these kind of mm-hmm. tunes. And the guitar was this broken Gibson. Like, it was made of, like, graphite or something. And it weighed, like, you know, 20 pounds. Oh, my God. <laughs> the amp sounded like someone had, like, just stabbed it repeatedly with a screwdriver in the speaker. I mean, it was wretched. <laughs> and I play. Sometimes I'd have a good day. But mostly it was, like, right before lunch class. And we go out to lunch. I'd be like, damn, I can't play that. No, no one can play that. You know, if only, I was blaming the tools. And then one day, halfway through the semester, this kid shows up. 
His name is John Smith. He later added a T because he wanted to, it didn't stand for anything. John T. John Smith. John T. Smith. <laughs> he actually became a very well-known guitar player. His nickname is Jubu, and he's played with Whitney Houston. He plays Maze, all these R&B, Tony, Tony, oh, Tony. Wow. Just, he came in there, he picked up that guitar, and he made it sing. Like, I couldn't believe it. I was so humbled by, like, that I had dared to blame the guitar. <laughs> His pocket and wow. the way he would make it sing. So that was like my next real tone lesson. I was like, whoa, I'll never blame my gear again. Of course, I would still do. But, <laughs> but not I, as I, I'm sure a lot less. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure a lot yeah, less. Thank you, man. That was a really great lesson. So that was a, yeah. Wow. He, you know, he grew up playing in, in, I think, in his dad's church and stuff. Like he just, he had, he's so funky. Oh, my God. People worship him. And I, I'm one of those people. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of people come out of the the church, you know, and oh yeah. You know, now a lot of people are going back into the church to play. You know, there's so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I have so many customers that are that are they're they play worship services really on the weekends. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Uh, there's so it? many musicians oh, into that now. Randolph, right? Robert Randolph. Robert Randolph. Yeah. Yeah. His whole family. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 They came out of the church. <laughs> yeah. And that that's it's that's, that's a special segment of that denomination that really favors steel guitar like he's not the only one yeah yeah, yeah there's, with, there's a, with a distortion pedal and a wawa at oh steel guitar. <laughs> you, know, you know if you're gonna make a talk make a talk man yeah man <laughs> oh man that rem that reminds me of something here can i play you guys something i'm finishing i'm going on i'm leaving on the road tomorrow with jefferson starship for our next uh, run but i gotta finish this article mm -hmm. do my first lesson article in a while and it's with kirk fletcher and he showed me these awesome blues chords and it relates to what you're saying about the church it goes it's like a blues progression I love it so much. It's like having a new skateboard or something. I'm like, cool, got a new progression. That's, that is awesome. That's that's like sets your playing the blues. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Oh, it's so funky. And I yeah. and I was asking him about the different parts of it, and I'm like, I love that one part where it goes. Yeah, to yeah, me, it sounded like cool. a, it sounded like a big band or something. Yeah. Like, where do you I was asking Kirk. He's a great guitar player, by the way. He plays. A, he's like one of the only guitar players that Joe Bonamassa has ever hired to play with him. Oh, wow. He's got his own solo record, Kirk Fletcher. Yeah, check him out. Hmm, definitely but, uh, will. The uh, the, the beginning says, the beginning of what you play, like the first chord or two, almost sounded like they could be on a church B three or something. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was, totally. It was he, so big. He, he grew up in in a playing in his dad's church in Inglewood, and uh, I asked him, but I said that one part that I just played. <laughs> He, I said, that sounds like a big band to me. He's like, no, I think I got that from the steel player, the steel guitar player at our church. He played pedal steel and plays stuff like that. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah, so, could be. That's, that's one of my favorite players, by the way, is Aubrey Gant. He plays lap steel. He just has it, and he plays in like, a, he's a pastor in a church in Florida. And it's just, he's one of my favorite guitar players. Wow. He'll, he'll play like Saints Go Marching In. And it'll be jamming. He'll take it to the moon on a simple. He'll take it to the moon and back. It's just unbelievable. Check it out. Yeah, yeah, man. It was, you know, our listeners. See, we, we have listeners that blame us because this show costs them money all the time. And every time we have a guest on, they go out and buy everything the guest ever did. Well, now they got at least three three people yes. that they have to buy exactly. already. <laughs> We're not even ten minutes in. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's fun. So it's that's crazy. I'm the same way. I'm always buying stuff. I just just this moment just got the new pedal train came up to my door from FedEx. So I'm leaving, putting together a new pedal board. They got this new series, the uh, Novo 18. I'm gonna. Give that it weighs nothing and it's the perfect size. Oh wow, hmm. very That'll cool! That'll be my evening Velcro and pedals. Oh yeah, <laughs> Velcro cables and pedals. Oh my, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, wait a minute. Let me get. Let me get back. Let me get back. Let me get. Uh, prog band. <laughs> yeah. Prog well, band. <laughs> yeah, that was called a Atomic Serenade, and then I had another slightly more rock band called Electric Spaghetti in high school, and um, then we. That's when I really started gigging. 
you know, and we, we used to play, I remember we played at the Omni, which was owned by John Nady. So everyone got to use a wireless, which was so cool. Oh, wow. Oh, the the actual Nady. Nady. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that's a guy, you should have him on here, man. You're just like, boom, that would be an incredible story, how he developed that whole company or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be really interesting. Yeah, so, you know, wireless has come a long way. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I played in a lot of bands. I played in... um in a Afro funk band called Wazobio led by a guy named Jeffrey Omadebu from Nigeria learned tons about funk. Wow. I'm talking about all this funk and gospel influence, but I have also have equally the rock influence, you know, like I, uh, my first concert was ACDC when I was 12. I was always an ACDC fan, but my little brother somehow, who's not even a music fan, he's like a film editor nowadays and he was a computer genius, like in junior high and you know, he was a total hacker. Like what? Yeah, who got you? What you going to AC? No, I'm going to ACDC. Like you're not going to go to rock concert before me. <laughs> I'm, the guy, I'm the rocker. Right. So, so I got tickets too. Me and my buddy, we went out, and I had no idea. I mean, I, I was so I'd never seen a concert before, and it just blew my mind. Like Angus Young, and you know the mm-hmm. whole thing, man. Lights go out, and we're getting crushed to death. Not maybe six months earlier, a bunch of people had died at the Who concert, which is a horrible tragedy oh. in Cincinnati. And, yeah, and I'm yep. this is in San Francisco at the Cow Palace, which is kind of a wretched place. And there's all these fights going on and bottles breaking, and then all of a sudden the crowd stands up and we get crushed. I'm like three feet from the stage, but I can't breathe, and I'm mm. like 12 years old, and and everyone's bigger than me, and I can't move. My feet aren't even touching the ground. It was crazy. <laughs> wow. I yeah. thought I, I kind of thought because of that Who thing that I might die. But then Mm -hmm. the lights go out and the big bell comes down and Angus comes out, you know? (laughs) A little more distortion. (laughs) I mean, that show blew my mind. So I also have this whole rock side. I've been, you know, I've had, I like to play Van Halen licks and stuff. I mean, I I like to mix that all together, you know, the the rock and the funk. That's in a little bit of Prague, I guess, but. To me, that's the whole thing. But the, the gospel and the and the funk and the soul is also just, just such a huge thing for me. Yeah, that I think that would. I mean, you could probably find a way to slide some prog in there a little bit, I guess, in a creative <laughs> way, you know. But uh, I mean, with the the prog stuff that you were doing back in the in the day was it? Were you guys writing original stuff, or were you covering, you know, prog at that time? It was all original. My favorite song was this one in a weird time signature. <laughs> Like that was the main riff for the song. We would just play that in twenty-five different ways and stuff. <laughs> but we also had reggae songs, and you know, we had a crazy lead singer, Jason Lee, rest his soul. Huh. He was, uh, he would lead the crowd and stuff. He was good. <laughs> he was funny. <laughs> oh man, he was edgy for his day. But you know this. Then I started playing in this band called Groove Shop that we put together. This time it was a rock band, but we had horns. Joshi Marshall and Gavin DeStasi, these two great horn players. Nice. And the, the, this was part of, we were like involved in this scene that was really amazing. And we had a very small involvement, but we played all the clubs. You know, we used to play at least once or twice a week there for a couple of years. Like, there's all these bands playing. Fungo Mungo, I mentioned. And this really became a huge scene. Psycho Funkopus, Fungo Mungo. Oh, got yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they got major label deals. The head of Island Records flew out from London for Fungo, and I think he's the guy that signed you too or something. He he signed them on the spot. It's like a Funkopus was got signed to Atlantic. My favorite band of all was uh, the Limbo Maniacs. They were just so evil and funky. Great guitar player named Merv Haggard in there. Wow. And uh, this was a whole scene. I'm telling you guys, it was blowing up. And then all of a sudden, what happened? Nirvana. And all of a sudden, they just they, all the major labels left the Bay Area, kind of. And this yeah. music was great in the Bay Area. You could like dance to it, but you could also headbang to it. It was a really good combination. And yeah, um, I could I could totally see that. I could totally see there, that. Yeah. Sure. And, there were a couple of bands that made it out: Primus <laughs> and Faith No More. Okay, yeah, there you go. And, um, They're I'm back sure. out by by the way. Faith No yeah, More. They, now everyone's back together. Now. <laughs> yeah. It's been 20 years. <laughs> but uh, that was this amazing scene. And my little band, Groove Shop, we opened for a lot of those bands and played around. And I was in college at UC Berkeley in Berkeley, California, getting a music degree. 
Nice. And that's pretty much what I was doing. I guess if you want to skip to my first actual real gig, that would be when I was 27 and got, I went down and auditioned for um, Melvin Seals and the JGB, which was a former members of the Jerry Garcia band. They called it JGB. It had like four original members. Cool. And um, I had been recommended for the audition by a great guitarist named Garth Weber. He played with Miles Davis, super yeah, funky. I, I definitely too. know the name. Oh man, he is wonderful. You guys, <laughs> he's got this this super amp Fender. It sounds so good, and he's running it off the light switch to re, you know, I mean, the dimmer knob to lower the voltage. <laughs> well, very action. You can't. These are the same tubes for twenty years or something. It's never. Wow. It sounds so good. Hmm. We tracked there. Anyway, I met him, and then they wanted him to go out, and he didn't want to leave his studio and stuff. He's a producer, and so he recommended me. So I went, I went down there to audition for Melvin Seals, and he's the organ player for Jerry Garcia. And, and the, the, I mean, this is crazy because the, the, the genres that we've already been through <laughs> that you play, and now you wind up in a, in a, a Garcia band? I mean, that's... <laughs> That's yeah. just wild, you know? I mean, we're always about, you know, we, the, the phrase comes up, just say yes, so many times. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> just say yes you, to you everything. Just say yes. <laughs> you said yes to so many genres. It, it's 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 mind-boggling. It's, you know, it's, and how do you progress from, you get good in one, and then you go, oh, I'm going to play this now, you know? Wow. And, that's that's just crazy. That's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you just yeah, you just got to go for it and see what happens. You learn so much when you just throw yourself into some new situation and you learn so much from people who are more experienced or, you know, have something. Mm -hmm. I mean, those have always been my best teachers, you know, people on the gig or something like jumping ahead recently I was I was playing with the uh, Stu Ham and the, those guys and B times three and Greg Cock, one of my favorite players. You know him, K O C H. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. He's... He came down and he sat in and he played my same rig. You know, and it's just like I just like, oh, okay, I'm taking notes, man. You just made this thing sound five dimensional. <laughs> what did you do? all this thing? You know, his bends and harmonics. He's such a great guitarist. And happened to we had George, we had George Lynch sit in with us recently. Same deal. Just like wow. damn, because I set up a rig for him, but he kind of went a little delay or something. And he, of course, he didn't make sound check or something. Mm -hmm. So we're on stage and he's up there and we're at the Canyon Club recently in uh, L.A. And I'm like, he's like, oh man, we're like in the middle of jam. He's like, do you have any, a little delay or something or a couple effects? I'm like, well, you should have come to Soundcheck Holmes. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> he's a friend. I, mean, I literally, I said, hey, take my guitar. I threw him my Stratocaster and we just switched guitars on the spot. So he's playing through my same exact pedals, tone, settings, guitar, pickup amp dialed the same knobs you know mm -hmm. and just to hear what he did with it it's always amazing like his bends he's such a blues he's a hard rocker but he's so bluesy and oh, soulful yeah. Yeah. yeah so i i always love all that but yeah anyway I, I know i'm getting way off track here but yeah <laughs> well that tells you it's in the hands it, yes. I, yeah i mean how many times have we said you stevie know, ray vaughan on a on a les yeah. paul through a whatever is going to be stevie ray vaughan exactly yeah. exactly well you know 95 percent of tone is in your hands the other 50% is in your gear. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a Yogi Berra ripoff. 60% of the time, it works 100% of the time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was, what was yeah. the, uh, the, my, the my favorite Yogiism? When you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> it's my favorite oh. Yogiism. <laughs> he's the best. He's the, he's the, yeah. That restaurant is so popular, nobody goes there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think that's one of his. <laughs> that's great that's but yeah, stuff, man. Anyway, you know, when I went, to, that's right when I had my first, what I would say, as a good amp. I got, there's a guy, James, at Blue Note Music in, in Berkeley, and uh, he was really cool. I came in there looking at some stuff. He's like, you know what you need? You need this matchless. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, I got all these amps in here, but this is the one you need. It was a matchless chieftain. Okay. Hmm. And, uh, I still have that thing. I can see it from here if I look around the corner. <laughs> and, uh, I, and, and I was like, cool. So I got And he's like, well, the thing is, you want to get the 1 by 12. And I was like 26. And I'm, I'm like, no, no, I think I need the 212 version. That thing is so fucking heavy, you guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. I've worked on plenty. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, man, I wish I had listened to him. I swear. But. 
But anyway, but back then it was no big deal. So I went to this audition and I literally carried in my match list and they lifted it up and put it on top of a Leslie speaker in the rehearsal room. <laughs> wow. And we, just, we played through the tunes and then boom, I was got to play with them and I was kind of terrified because it was like, boom, you got to get on a, well, first we did a couple practice gigs to make sure that everything felt good. And then a week later, it was like six week tour on tour bus starting flying to Detroit, Michigan and. And I was kind of like, it seemed kind of overwhelming at the time, but the second I got there, it's kind of like when you, I don't know if you ever got on a jet ski, the second you turn the throttle on a, on a, like a wave runner or something, mm -hmm. like instantaneous, you're just like, I get this. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling this and you're gone. Well, that's kind of how I felt when I got out there with that band. It was just. And how old were you at that point? That I think is 27 then. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um. And in the first gig I show up at, another great tone lesson, Steve Kimmock is playing because wow. he's in the other – I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's, oh, yeah. he's a tone magician. I love some of his stuff. I think he might even be have a Dumble and stuff, but again, it doesn't matter what he plays. He's going he's gonna to sound amazing and mm -hmm. his timing and everything. And he's at Soundcheck. He's doing this thing. is Vince Welnick on keyboards from uh, Grateful Dead or he played with the Dead for a few years. Mm -hmm. And um, – they're on stage. I'm just looking at this guy. I'm like, this is unbelievable. And then he's pulling out the lap steel and the tones. And the, yeah, that was a, that was the beginning of that that three year stint with with Melvin. <laughs> I was yeah. watching Steve Kimock fry my brain. Yeah, he's, he's another guy interviewed mm -hmm. years later, and I learned so much from him. Yeah, he's he's totally in that that whole genre too. The, yeah. the dead kind of thing. Um, it, it's unbelievable player. Just unbelievable. Yeah, player. you know, a lot of times too. Um, guys will dismiss those guys as not being you know because it is a different type of almost country in some aspects it's, some of it you know when you mm -hmm. hear it but it's not for the faint no. of heart if you're playing guitar no. man i mean kimok has a major reputation uh, he he really does he's he's been around for decades yeah and he's just he's ridiculous yeah i mean he he plays so there's so much space between his notes and his tone is is really I mean he's truly psychedelic amazing player a lot of people said that he was Jerry Garcia's favorite guitar player well, I wouldn't doubt and that to hmm. so me he kind of sounds almost like Jerry Garcia probably sounded in his head you know it's like a, it's slightly <laughs> more evolved and and it's really you know it's really crystal clear and <laughs> yeah and uh, he taught me a lot about tuning like you know. I mean, this is really interesting to me, and I think once you understand the concept, but I mean, you guys probably know about the overtone series and all this stuff way more than I do, but like if you take like a, an A major chord and you tune it to your tuner, the third is always going to be sharp, you know, according to your tuner, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it will be. Like, and Eddie Van Halen had this quote, like, in the Guitar Player magazine, I remember reading it when I was 13, he was like, man, if you start dicking around with thirds and sevenths through a blazing marshal, it's going to not sound good or something. But the thing is, we're used to that sound. That's actually an out-of-tune sound. But that's actually very sharp, because all the that's not in tune with the harmonics. Steve Kimmock showed me, you know, if I tune the B string down, that sounds flat. Then when you play your A chord, I guess it's hard to tell, but it's just screaming now. You can hear it. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Then, absolutely. Uh, you know, people, they love Keith Richards' tone and stuff. And sure, a lot of it's his vintage gear and everything, but he tunes his guitar. I'm positive. I haven't asked him or his tech or anything, but I'm positive when he does those fat one-finger A chords, he's got the third not so sharp, so it sounds so like, you know, like it's going to curdle milk like most <laughs> guitars. <laughs> I'm talking about oh yeah sure. I don't even quite have it all the way there yet but if I ever get the opportunity I'll have to ask Pierre again when I, if I see him again I'll ask him if uh, yeah if he tunes them down yeah yeah so can, slide players do that too you see that you see them lean the slide a little bit back on the lower end of the slide mm-hmm I think sometimes it gets the major third from being so sharp, you know. So these are the kind of things that Steve would show me. Like I was really interesting how that because that's the third that's in the harmonic series, you know. That's the third that, as he would explain it to you, like a barbershop quartet when they sing and they harmonize, your human ear wants to hear that. But pianos and guitars are locked into this tuning. Right. Well, I'm, you know, I'm sure that's that's what the uh, the Buzz Feetin 
whole system was developed for because it's you know the the yeah. the guitar was never really correct uh, and correct you know a yeah. guitar that was in you know you can tune it with a tuner but it's not in tune with itself well we know? were we were talking about that with uh with gretchen where i mentioned the true temper systems that they now develop right where the frets are like look like a jigsaw puzzle on the neck yeah but you know the tuners now a lot of them have the buzz feet and calibration calibration yeah. because yeah. if you just try to use it straight it'll actually be out of whack right because they right. they compensate the nut is what right. they do right and it's uh irvana too they have a that's a nut oh, that, okay. that is a replacement it's even a little bit more compensated <laughs> yeah these things are all they're all really great tools and stuff i think but i don't think there's any one fretboard design or nut design that'll work in every single key but it once you realize that, that you can kind of adjust your tuning a little bit yeah. for different keys, or you're recording something with a D major chord in the intro, and you really want that guitar, like you know what? It's okay if your third is a little bit flat for that. This is a, this was kind of mind boggling to me. Like, it's, I, again, Steve Kimock put it best. He said, "Guitar players spend half their lives tuning their guitars, and the other half playing out of tune." <laughs> 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 It's kind of true. That's I put great. that in the article. Yeah. That was the opening line, you know, because it's like it's never it's never going to be perfect in all keys. You get that third perfect in the A, then you go to play a D chord in the open position, and the and the upper octave is going to be flat. So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's very interesting. That is very it's, interesting. I guess fretless would take care of that. Could you? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can. yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but then it sounds it doesn't it doesn't sound right. Yeah, because it, it it's it a, it's like a fretless either. bass. It's like you know, it's got that weird, cause, you know, the sliding is so different. You know, well, that's that's you know, I, I assume that there are bass players that can play a fretless and not have to slide into a note. You yeah, know? but yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just I've always been terrified of fretless, which is not an original thing for a guitar player to say, but I, I think a lot of it is the idea of trying to play chords. <laughs> to land three or four fingers at the exact right spot. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. That sounds rather intimidating. <laughs> totally. Scary concept there. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Oh. Well, like I said, that, that one demo with the Viger, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Guthrie Govan, and he's like yeah. going nuts. The guy's just playing a million notes, and he's it just sounds so incredible. And he goes... Yeah, I got to get used to this. I've only had 45 minutes to really learn how to use this. <laughs> First time oh, I've yeah. used it, I'm like, 45 <laughs> minutes. 45. He's ridiculous. He's, you know, it's funny. I just interviewed him yesterday for because they have a new album coming out. And yeah, we we talked about that. Wow. And, uh, he has a lot to say. It's really interesting. You know, it's like for him, it's like, don't try to whatever you pick up. Don't try to play your old style on the new instrument. Fretless is new. You got to figure out how to make that work. If you pick up a MIDI guitar with a piano, a MIDI guitar with a piano patch, he says, then, of course, don't try to play like soul bends or shred licks maybe try to adjust your playing and it'll work out interesting so, of course that's it's easy for guthrie govin yeah, to say uh, yeah exactly exactly <laughs> Wait, give me an hour i'll have it uh, yeah, yeah yeah i know every style on the man yeah so. so you you were in the uh the, the jgb for uh for a while how long about two and a half three years and we yeah we just crisscrossed the country it was it was a lot of fun i mean there's you know that's when i realized there's no better way to travel than playing with a band Especially if you have people doing the driving, you know, and you just, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a really, a, it's really a blessing if you ever get that opportunity. It's just a wonderful thing. And I'm still doing, I still enjoy that quite a bit. You know, I've seen so many places all over the world. You can, you know, Stonehenge, the Vatican, Israel, Jerusalem, all these places, Brazil. Wow. And I've been paid to play music there. You know, most people are on their vacation or whatever. I mean, it's, yeah. and I'm not bragging or anything. I mean, it's like, I'm just completely humbled by any opportunity. And, and what I do is so much smaller than someone who, like, say, I don't know, my friend James Valentine uh, from Maroon 5. Mm -hmm. It's insane what that band does, you know? So, yeah, it's, it's great. It's, it's, you know, I mean, you got to feel blessed, man. You really do. Yeah. Well, yeah, anytime you have a, the moment where you're allowed to turn up your amp and rock out and and do your thing and you know even and then on top of it maybe get paid a little bit like that's an incredible thing and, for sure uh, yeah for yeah sure. and jude does it well by the way <laughs> yeah um i've seen a couple of his videos yeah, online i'm yeah. like wow uh, for sure well thank you and, and do you uh, that one uh salamander right did you yeah. uh did you did you edit all that video yourself 
Well, I have exactly two music videos. I put out one music video every 20 years, so that's kind of um, how it goes. <laughs> Actually, I did one with Gretchen, too, called um, Tri-Tip, in which we murder a Stratocaster. And so that, I guess that, that counts as my first music video. My second would be Funky Town, which was mm-hmm. done by Eric Shamlin. He's a great video producer. I think he does professional auto commercials and stuff, but he, he's done a couple of videos for Gretchen, and she had introduced me to him, and he did did my Funky Town video, which was really cool. He cloned cloned a bunch of us. He made four of me and then the dancer that was in it. He cloned her and made like 12 of her. Yeah. It was really neat. It's professional. <laughs> but then I was like, for Salamander, I'm like, you know what? I want to have this song up tomorrow. I've already finished this song. I'm tired of just, just sitting around. So, <laughs> and I've been making some of these videos on the road, these little tour videos. And you can do a lot of it just on your phone, you know? Wow. So yeah. I shot that on my phone, but... Normally, I would just even edit it on my phone. Like when you're sitting on a f- cross country flight, you can edit together a bunch of videos right on your phone. That's Put insane. in music. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. A- Apple iMovie. Yeah. 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 You know, it used to be called a phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you call people on it. Now, nobody even calls people on it anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they just text them. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, but syncing, syncing the uh, various clips with the song was a little more difficult for the phone so i did have to do that one on iMovie laptop version Mm -hmm. but but you're right i just i did that video and one day my brother's a professional film editor i'm like dude i need need something that looks cool he's like you should go to the site it's a public domain site i'm blanking on the you know archive.org maybe yeah Hmm. and you got those clips and all yeah so i grabbed this old movie called the phantom creeps this awesome robot sequence it's public domain where this creepy robot walks out and then somebody gets the remote controls and like uses him like (laughs) for purposes of evil and right i I saw it yeah yeah and it's the worst looking robot on the planet i know it's really weird (laughs) low budge (laughs) it's like from the 30s or the 20s man it's It's, yeah i think it's from like 39 or something (laughs) it's got the the robot remote control strapped to his wrist you know it's It's giant great yeah yeah it's got five buttons on it like the size of like the buttons you'd see on like an old arcade game like defender or something yeah <laughs> how do you control all those movements with uh, five buttons i don't know <laughs> technology man yeah, it Come was on. way way advanced more than <laughs> that's right <laughs> hand gestures yeah that's right just anyway, gesture yeah so i threw that around there that's great that's but, fantastic. Uh, yeah that video uh i've actually sold digitech Quite a few synth was, you know that sound. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's that pedal I got? And my friend Scott Parker bought both that and the Boss Slicer. That's also in that video. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know what? I was like, that's that's the ultimate compliment if somebody buys your gear that you have. That's you know? cool. That's yeah. cool. Like, you were listening to Richie Fliegler. He was talking about those valve state amps. It's such a great story where he's in the boardroom and they come up with that name and how things come together, teamwork, and, and and granted, that was kind of a low-end amplifier, but when I was in college, you know, I didn't have much money, and I saw this guy play, and he sounded so fucking good, he, you know, and, it, and when he switched over to distortion, it was totally distorted, but clear, and, and he was playing a little vowel state combo, mm. so I'm like, yeah, I got to have one of those, yeah, so yeah, they, I thought that's the ultimate compliment, if someone buys your gear, that means they like your playing, <laughs> And you yeah, know those you am- sound like you. Those amps weren't quiet. They were loud. Yeah, the valve state. Uh, yeah, the valve state stuff. No, no, no. Uh, um, oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, because yeah. that's when that's when Richie was at Marshall, right? That was the yeah. Valve I knew state, yeah. I knew a guy that had a one twelve combo, and I don't know what the wattage was on that thing. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. all yeah, you know, it's all transistor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, except, except for the valve. And let me tell you, that thing was crazy loud i was like my god because i never you know i just they didn't it just didn't take off with the public like right they hoped you know i mean that's what well, Richie was they, saying it did yeah. pretty good yeah they did it did i they, i've seen some videos some of them sound really really good i mean you well, know you know like we all say it's a lot of it's in the hands you know a lot of it's in the yeah. hands it yeah. Just, uh, yeah. yeah don't blame the tools right. <laughs> well it's like ty Tabor, man you know he used those lab series forever oh, yeah. yeah well you know they all they he he finally made the switch well you hear him now and it's the same guy it's just now through something else i think right. he's playing orange now yeah 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 couldn't be any further from lab series totally totally <laughs> oh yeah 
but the um, uh, what? How did you go from uh, JGB to uh, doing the the BX three thing? Oh well, you know, um, that was because of my friends to him. Before JGB, I had a rock band with a great singer named Dan Ross. And we were called Zenner, and we got management from Bill Graham Management. Huh. And Kevin was over there, and he was this great guy, and uh, he managed us, and he also managed or co-managed Joe Satriani. And he's like, you guys are, you know, paid your dues a little bit, and you made a cool little group of tunes that never really officially got released, but we made like an EP. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got us to open for Joe Satriani on three shows. And uh, they were, each one of them were like really big shows. First one was in Reno. <laughs> Whoa. And, uh. And uh, we're playing at some big casino, and it went really well. You know, I think it, it was cool. Like um, we we had vocals and everything, so ah. you had a sea full of dudes who brought their wives or girlfriends. The wives and girlfriends seemed to like us quite a bit. Like just, <laughs> I mean, just the music. Like because we did a little video. What did you guys think of the opening band? And guys were like, yeah, it's cool. Girls were like, oh, they were great. The singer was killer, Dan Ross, man. <laughs> that's because they're you know you had you had a vocalist you know you had the women at that yes. point you know yeah now he's like a, I was gonna say he's like a mixture of Lane Staley and Jim Morrison like oh, Lane wow, Staley wow. Allison Chains <laughs> yeah uh, now was, was uh, that was that like a uh, one of those Rio shows where one hundred and fifty thousand of your best friends show up or was it a you said it was in a casino so was it small it was like it was a high ticket event like it was, it was probably like fifteen hundred. You know, that's a good show. <laughs> and um, and then, and then the next morning in the lobby, well, that's when I really officially meet Stu Ham. Although I, I like, I heard you say when the podcast, I saw him on the tour. I saw him like with Joe Satriani like a year earlier or something. Mm -hmm. Just blow down the house with his bass solo and that tone. It was like no one had ever seen anything like that before. The really bright strings and the orchestral slapping and the sense of humor and the playing in Star Trek and Peanuts and at a <laughs> billion that's all like he just put on a show so I knew who he was but I finally met him in the in front of some slot machines or whatever I mean we were just at the checkout desk or whatever and he's like he's like cool cool show last night guys uh, so I guess I'll see you at the airport in a couple hours we're like uh, no um, we're driving in my pickup truck to San Jose for the next show and he's like oh shit sorry <laughs> So that's when I first met Stu, and then we did two more shows, like San Jose and Santa Rosa, great venues, like big venues, and we kind of kept in touch, and then he was doing his one of his solo albums, and he invited me to play on two songs. The solo oh, album nice. was called Outbound, and then, you know, I was working at Guitar Player Magazine starting in 2001, full-time in the Bay Area as an editor, but I always had time, you know, I was always able to go on little tours here and there, and he calls me up for this thing, you know. G3 is going off all the time with Satriani and Vi and, mm -hmm. and whoever the guest guitar. He's like, how about a B times three? He didn't want to really just call it B3. That would be too similar. But, you know, right. call it B times three. Three bassists and me on guitar and John Mater on drums. So the bassists were Stuart Hamm, Jeff Berlin, and then Billy Sheehan. So it was a it was like a three hour show, man, and no, no slouches <laughs> there. No, we'd be working our asses off every night, man, playing <laughs> wow. all these different genres, and you know, that was a really really fun band. I mean, I, I won't lie to you, it was pretty scary because there was no real rehearsal. You know, there's I think we had like one sound check where we were able to play for a couple hours, but you had to learn all the songs in advance. We met in Milwaukee. I'd never met Jeff Berlin before. I'd always heard about, you know, mm -hmm. how opinionated he is about things and stuff, and and you know how just strong his beliefs are in certain things. I was terrified, but you know what? He turned out to be just the coolest guy, man. Nice, I mean, yeah. He's unbelievable. I mean, he he knows that I'm not like Bruce Foreman, who's an incredible jazz player, you know, or I'm not a Scott Henderson who he tours with regularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he met me halfway. You know, I, I can play some jazz, and we did a bunch of jazz. We did, we leaned it a little bit fusiony, made a little weather report. Some of his tune, he did nice. some of his original. It, it was just such a wonderful experience playing with Jeff. And then you know, Stuart Stewart does like the craziest, more classical set almost. Like he's so orchestral with his bass arrangements and his song arrangements and big melodies, and he's so funny too. Both all those guys are hilarious. I remember being at Soundcheck once in Buffalo, New York, and pretty big room and 
after Stu does a sound check, he goes, how's the sound out there? And someone says, sounds good, Stu, but the guitar is a little quiet. And he goes, okay, thanks. And then just turns off his amp and walks off stage. <laughs> <laughs> That's Stu for you. Like, okay, cool. Like, he's just kidding around. Like, 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 I'm good. I get the guitar dialed at all. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. But I mean, that's that's a no pressure there. You know, learn com three completely different <laughs> sets, three different styles. Exactly. You know, and go and okay, you got to you know pretty much hone it in during a sound check. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No it was, pressure. It was, it was a lot of notes. You know, a lot of notes to learn. And, yeah. And um, then there was guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, guitar man. yeah great <laughs> my god you know um at that time they were the three hot guys because i mean you know when you really think about it right uh you have sheehan and and of course uh, uh Stu. but you know you had you 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 know the the ones that were outside of that were in bands you know like getty lee and yeah. steve harris and mm -hmm. you know it, it was those guys were in bands. They weren't right. like, you know, part of this instrumental thing that was taken off. And of course, yeah. you know, Sheehan came out of nowhere from the David Lee Roth thing. And, and it was like, what? Well, he had Talis <laughs> yeah. before David Lee Roth. Yes, but Talis couldn't get, I mean, you know. They didn't they, go. They were well known. They just. In Buffalo. <laughs> well, we kind of knew them around here, too, you know. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, it's like as far as the car could drive, that's where you knew them. Exactly. Uh, exactly. But then they got that. You know, when they had that two-headed monster with Steve and uh, mm -hmm. Billy, then, you know, the notes were aplenty. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, those guys are so funny, too. All three of those guys. You know, being a writer, Bass Player Magazine hired me, actually, to uh, write a cover story on that band just because I'm in the van with them, traveling with these three guys, playing from town to town. We also went to Asia. And, um, yeah, if, I, if anyone could be so lucky as to hang out with those guys, not even just playing music just the stories they tell i mean it, i was falling over laughing all the time like in pain suffocating which one of them is so funny stop i need billy, to breathe exactly <laughs> <laughs> billy tells these old talus tour stories of them pulling pranks on each other and it's just like the way he tells such a good storyteller is just so funny jeff yeah oh my god so that was a, that was a great time <laughs> And That's awesome. Oh, and now, you know, Reservoir Dog. I mean, uh, Winery Dogs. Winery Dogs. Not yeah. Reservoir Dog. That's a whole different thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's our movie podcast. That's for Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, if you, if you watch this video that me and Gretchen Men made where we just murder the guitar, it was like we had the opportunity to work with Massive Post, a great um, production company that does video and stuff and um, wow. here in L.A. And we had like 24 hours. Like, what should we do? I was like, hmm, well, I have an idea. Let's smash a guitar. <laughs> you, you guys know Gretchen. I mean, she's like so brilliant and stuff. And she's like, yo, that is stupid. Let me think about this. And a minute later, she says, okay, I've got it. We're going to get dressed in black and white, like nice suits, almost like mafia. And we're going to recreate the reservoir dog scene where they torture that guy in the chair. <sighs> Only it's going to be a guitar. And we're going to torture this guitar to death. We're not just going to smash it. And so. Wow. <laughs> So sure enough, we do. It came out great. We uh, like. So she she, sits she's on demented too. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, she's so sick. Just, really, yeah, I, I, you know, I've done. I find most people a fair. I always say, a sick mind is a sign of a healthy mind. <laughs> there you go. There you go. If that makes any sense. Just having like you know a sick sense of humor, a little bit twist, like. A, I don't know. I played some gigs with Kristen Chenoweth, just an amazing uh, singer, you know, mm -hmm. and we played like the Tonight Show and all this and American Country Awards. But, you know, you sit down, start goofing off like she's just got a twisted sense of humor, just like everyone else, even though she's America's poster girl for, you know, Broadway <laughs> star. And it's just I yeah. love that about people. They're just so funny. People are so funny. Yeah. So Gretchen came up with that and she like sits on the guitar's lap, so to speak, and like puts a cigarette cigarette out on the headstock. <laughs> <laughs> I got to see this video. Oh we God, made this guitar, is great. We made the guitar sweat like the producers Greg Conway and they like put the um made it drip sweat down the, the really looks real. Oh, that's like the guitar awesome. is actually sweating and then I take pliers to it and I break some strings and the last thing you see is like a chalk outline of a strat on the ground. 
<laughs> that is awesome. It came wow. out pretty cool. We'll probably redo it with an electric version of the same song. But um, <laughs> that is too funny. Yeah, man, that's, that's that is too funny. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, you know, maybe, maybe I don't know. Did you have your style before or after the BX3 tour? Because I thought slapping was just reserved for bass players. <laughs> but man, I, you know, I've seen some video. It's like I, I've never seen anybody play that style on a guitar. When did you develop that style? Well, you know, that's interesting because uh, yeah, people often will say like oh that's like a new style or it's like a technical thing but for me it's just how I play it's not even like I, I first started listening to music I told you about that like disco was on the radio mm -hmm. you'd hear like jams like earth wind and fire all these great grooves you know like yeah. all kind of slap bass was on the radio like boogie oogie oogie or something But you know, for me, it's more about the harmonics. You got to have the Van Halen in there too. You know, if you mix the harmonics with the slap notes and the pop notes, you get a style that's just. For me, I just call it full contact because it's not just slap and pop. It's like so many things. Like, here's a song that I'm working on that Trevor Thompson wrote, and I kind of have rearranged and reinvented some of the guitar parts. One more time. One, two, three, four. <laughs> fun to just like play this <laughs> and so for me i guess it's got, <laughs> it's got one of those liquid wrists you know <laughs> yeah it's, like, wow. it's a mixture of funk bass and then i got into like chili peppers you know you definitely want to get some flea in there mm -hmm. But you mix that with the open strings, and you mix that with the harmonics. Like if you slap any note 12 frets higher, you're going to get a... That's just an A pentatonic scale, but I'm slapping the notes 12 frets higher. Yep. And you get that chime, you know, you get yeah. that thing coming out. And that's, that's so different than, than you know fingering a note and tapping the harmonic you know it's it's yeah. such a different sound when he slaps it sure you know yeah, yeah. now well, you get the percussion and the ring it's so cool now now jude i was telling uh jeff before the show have you ever have you met uh dave martone from uh, uh from canada he he does yeah. a, he does a lot of that crazy stuff because <laughs> when i heard it yeah, i was like man that really sounds familiar and then mm. i remembered it was dave martone that i've heard a couple of his tunes that do that too yeah, he's a He's a homie of mine, and I think we uh, did a, um, a lesson, or maybe uh, Chris Bono might have written that lesson, but I might have edited it. Yeah. But yeah, Dave Martone, great player, man, totally. I was all, I just exactly think outside the box and yeah. and have fun. Yeah. Plays a, like, uh, he plays Parker Flies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Great guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah for me, it's just, you know, like if you take those harmonics and and you throw them in with the funk then you definitely have this kind of a certain sound. Like, uh, yeah, we, you were just talking about Van Halen. He would tap the harmonics. But when you, when you slap it and you're muting the strings with your fretting hand so that only the one note comes through, then it's much more aggressive. Like I might do. You can do a lot of like, crap. you know, <laughs> That's, you know, it's just, I don't know. <laughs> that, There's the scary monster. That sounds like 8,000 yeah. things going on at once, man. Yeah. It's just yeah. so crazy. Yeah, I just it's, love the percussive nature of yeah, it. Yeah, well, know? you know, uh, was it like Andy McKee and guys like that with those, you know, with that finger style stuff that they do where mm -hmm. they're beating all over the guitar. Yeah. But now you're doing it with the electric guitar. Right. It's even 
it's on even the strings, crazier on the strings. Yeah, yeah, because you, know, you can't really beat on the guitar too much with the electric. Yeah, I mean they're yeah. they're they're beating on bodies to get all rhythms and everything, which is very very cool. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, yeah, but yeah, and I love all cool this stuff. stuff. I love all that stuff. I'm I'm proud to have met Andy McKee and uh, booked him for a clinic. And he came to when at, at MI when I was kind of the director of the guitar program at GIT MI. Mm-hmm. I had all these great clinics. Had Andy come in there, and I love all that stuff. But for me, the my style, like I still want there to be a drummer. Like I'm still playing with a drummer. Those guys are like they're a one man band. Yeah. Like they don't, yeah. they don't necessarily need a separate drummer. This is designed to still fit, you know. Oh yeah. It's like it just it's, it's an attitude more than anything else. Sometimes I think it's just an, it's just like a nasty attitude. You just you know just make up random stuff at any given second. <laughs> that is hey, cool, and, and it always gets the aggression out because he's always hitting it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's he's he gets to be a drummer too. How cool is that? The the part that I like and uh, is where it you know you're you're in this you know he does this like uh, what is that a triplet yeah. or something? It's, mm-hmm. He just throws out a flurry it's, of right, with with the rubber yeah. wrist. You yeah. Know? yeah, and it's like how do you do that? <laughs> I would well, lose a fingernail. Like <laughs> it's all just a sequence of really simple moves that it, that you just put them together. Like if you sit behind a drum set, it's not hard to hit the hi hat or hit the snare drum or hit the kick drum. But putting those three things together in a cool way—that's yeah. the actual motions aren't terribly difficult. It's just kind of putting it together to create these rhythmic things and mm-hmm. keeping them in the pocket. You know, if I should name two people that influenced me. I've had so many teachers over the year. First of all, Tuck Andress. I don't know if you're familiar oh, yeah. with him. He was my teacher when I was 18, and wow. he's just—he's a one-man band. I mean, he mm-hmm. plays two or three parts at the same time. He, mm. he first thing he taught me was just you know basic like walking blues. That kind of stuff where you're playing the bass line, and then, you know you start getting into that stuff. And I got into like Charlie Hunter. Charlie Hunter would play like more funky. He taught me some lessons. I'd see him play like Stevie Wonder. The horn line at the same time as the bass line. How'd that go? The song I Wish. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so much fun playing that stuff, right? You got. But I mean, I consider myself an amateur at this stuff. You know, you know, my favorite person who plays like this is probably Ben Lacey. Don't know Ben. No. Ben Lacey, you got. I'll send you some videos. It's <laughs> he talk. I mean, it's the feel good guitar player of of planet Earth. When he's playing, <laughs> he, just, he does that. He likes it. Like he'll take a song that you've heard your whole life, like Toto, Toto's um, Rosanna, and he'll play it and he'll play all the parts on one guitar and just sit there. He posts these videos wow. on Facebook. They're phenomenal. You, wow. A lot of times you can't even see him because it looks like he's practicing and arranging his songs while lying back in an easy chair. <laughs> <laughs> so you see the camera level, but the guitar is lying flat and you, and you just see his hands and maybe you know a little bit of his chest or something. And you see like the pictures on the wall and just, well, we, it's like, we wouldn't want to exert ourselves yeah. now. It's, just, it's so funny. He lies there until he gets the arrangement down, and then he just hits film, and boom. I mean, these are so funky. I, you got to check it out. Like he does yeah. cashmere, Led Zeppelin. Uh, he is just—it's just hilarious and funky, and just wow. He's one of my favorite players now, for sure. Now let me ask you: um, as far as drummers go, have you ever like had an opportunity to play with like Chad Smith? Because I think that cat is just unbelievable. It's funny you should you should say that because uh, when in nineteen when I was in college in like ninety five, there was an ad in Bam magazine. I don't know if you remember this. And yes, I totally agree with you. That guy is so funky, and uh, he he plays aggressively, but it's funky oh, still. God, it's not yeah. too rock. It's like still got that booty on it, you know. Still, yeah. still got it's got some junk in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I love Chad Smith, and uh, there is an advertisement, Red Hot Chili Peppers looking for a new guitarist. This is before the internet, right? So I called the number, and, and I left a message. And then like a week later, I get a, I get a message on my answering machine, 
I don't know if people, li- everyone knows what these are who's listening, but for you, know, <laughs> I do. Go we home do. and you hit this device, and it would ha- literally have a cassette tape, and it plays the message back. Right. You have to come home and press play. <laughs> come home, press play. And this, this voice is on there. She says, Your audition with the Chili Peppers is blah, 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 three weeks from now on a Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. This is the address, Lancashire Boulevard, West, um, North Hollywood, California. Be there. You can't call back. There's no email. There's no website. So my buddy, I'm my buddy. He's like, dude, we gotta go. You're going. He like buys me a plane ticket, and so I'm like, okay. So I end up going down there. There's like 90 guitar players in line that morning. Oh Some guys gosh. are bringers. One guy brought his Soldano half stack with him. He's like waiting in line with the rest of us with a half stack. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people are like, I want. I'll do anything for this gig. I'm. I'm gonna show him. You know, and uh, and. By some miracle, I was one of the guys that got through that day, and they said, okay, come back later. There's like seven of us, and I uh, got to play with Flea and Chad Smith, wow, and we rocked man. out. And Anthony Kiedis was not there, but we were like the, we were like a little Chili Peppers rhythm section for 15 minutes, and That's so it was nice. really fun. You know, Flea the- was really nice to me. He had like a fever of 102 or something, and Ooh. he was like, looked like he was going to die, and I was the last guy, and he was like, He's like plug in, not mean, but just like he looked like he was about to die. Mm-hmm. And then when we played, we had this great jam, and he started. He lit up and smiled, and he was like, "Oh man, that was killer, man!" It, they didn't call me. I think you know everyone knows they got um. Oh, why am I blanking on his name? You know, Jane's addiction. Dave Navarro. Yeah. yeah. Dave Navarro. Thank you. Yeah. But um, not that I was necessarily in the running or anything. I don't think I was, but I was just happy that I made Flea smile and that he had a good jam and had this fever. Oh, that hell, he was... man. If there were about seven of you left, you were definitely in the running. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? Absolutely. That was, just, that was just that day. I think they went through like probably 150 guitar players before they got to, wow. <laughs> got mm. to Dave Navarro, you know. So, But that was a neat little story. So to answer your question, randomly... <laughs> I did play with Chad. That's cool. That, that's and, you know, cool. the only other guy that i ever seen hit the drums like Chad is uh, John Mayer's drummer, Steve Jordan. Oh, oh he's yeah. great. When yeah. I, I saw him at Crossroads, mm-hmm. and that was the first time I ever saw him. Uh, it's the first time I ever saw John Mayer, right, was at Crossroads. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he wasn't doing any of that your body's a wonderland right. stuff. It was all crazy blues, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Steve Jordan looked like he went from like about 400 feet behind the drum set every hit. <laughs> I mean, it looked like his arm was literally like attached with a ball bearing at the shoulder. And I was yeah. like, oh my God. I mean, without a doubt, just the most amazing wow. guy to watch. But meanwhile, he was like Chad. He was just in that pocket. Mm-hmm. But it was just so... It was like arms, and you know, it's just so cool looking yeah, to watch wow. it. You know, wow, yeah, man, it's so much fun playing with a great drummer like that. I've never got, got to meet Steve Jordan, but I've seen him play with uh, John Mayer at the uh, arena in San Jose, and yeah, I totally agree. He's just amazing. You know, it's funny. I should mention my buddy Jeff Coleman, killer guitar player, plays with Chad Smith. If you're ever in LA, they have a band. It's like the uh, I want to say the Fabulous Meat Bats or <laughs> Meat Bats. And this is Chad's fun band. They just plays for fun. They do whatever they want. They play the baked potato. They throw down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we had Chad Smith do a clinic at, at Musicians Institute where I still work. Um, I'm only there like, you know, one afternoon a week now just to teach because I really love the place. But but um, when I was there full time, there we, I was, uh, we used to have clinics all the time and, and the drum department brought him in. He was so funny. Everyone knows he looks like Will Ferrell, but he's just <laughs> totally. that too. The ladies and gentlemen, Chad Smith, he comes out, the place is completely packed. <laughs> he just starts, he doesn't even go near his drum kit. He just starts walking in the front. He's like looking at guys in the front row. He's like, hey, man, what's your name? What's that? Who's that girl next to you? That's your girlfriend? Do you want her to be your girlfriend? What's up with that? But what? Like, it's just like <laughs> so bizarre, man. <laughs> He's just a personality. Yeah, he was fun. Yeah. I met him for a few seconds at um, uh, it was a Lyric Opera House downtown. Oh, really? It was uh, it, it's, uh, it's Satch, the Red Rocker. What was the... Uh, oh, oh, oh um, yeah, uh, uh, Chicken Foot. Yeah, Chicken Foot, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... 
Yeah, he, that's he, right. He's, I forgot. He's crazy. Yeah, you know? He's funny. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah he's... All right. So I I gotta know. We we get through all this stuff. You're you're playing Grateful Dead. You're playing funk. You're playing guitar like nobody else plays guitar. Yeah. You, you know. You're 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 playing three different kinds of genres on a bass tour. How does it all boil down to Starship? Well, how did I... that happen? Well, this has been a really fun thing. I've been doing it almost three years, and uh, they're they're just it's, the Jefferson Starship is like a family. It's the most family feeling band that I've ever played in. So it's a really wonderful thing. And um, yeah, you know, I I, uh, I after being a guitar player magazine until two thousand nine, mm-hmm. I got offered a job a position to move to LA from San Francisco and uh, be the director of the guitar program at Musicians Institute. So I was doing that for almost four years. Meanwhile, I still gig and I play a lot with Kathy Richardson, this great singer in her solo band. She's like got a Grammy nomination on one of her albums and she's a kick-ass singer. She used to star in that play Love, Janice. Oh. Well, it turns out that she sings in Jefferson Starship and... Also, Donnie Baldwin, the great drummer who I used to play with in JGB. He's the drummer in Jefferson Starship and also has the same management. So there's some of that. But really, I have to thank Slick Aguilar, the great guitarist, too, because he invited me to play with them on multiple occasions. Like we, I was playing two gigs with Kathy, and in between those two gigs, they had a, they had a Jefferson Starship show up in Indiana. So I'm just kind of hanging out. And... And Slick, man, coolest dude. He's a great guitar player, too. He's played with David Crosby and like uh, Casey and the Sunshine Band, but he also has been in the Jefferson Starship for 17 years or something. Wow. He invites me to sit in because he, kind of, he, he treats me like he knows me. I don't think he's read a few things in Guitar Player Magazine and such, but, but really he's just a friend to everyone. And he's just like, what's up, man? He, the roadie's like, oh, man, we already packed the truck. There's no more. He's like, go get him a Fender Twin right now. <laughs> I'm like it's okay man it's like raining outside and thunder and lightning this guy brings a Fender Twin over we set it up and then I figure I'll play one or two songs he's like he makes me play like 13 songs luckily I know know a lot of songs just from hearing them in the radio and mm-hmm. stuff and you know when in doubt lay out whatever but right. you know <laughs> Paul Kander's on the other side of the stage looking over like but apparently he asked somebody who's that guy also <laughs> <laughs> famer Paul Kander, who I had met once or twice before. I think at Kathy's wedding, the singer, I, I met him briefly beforehand. But I, I think I literally snuck off the stage. Slick was so cool, and I was like, you know, I played like eleven songs, and like I just, I just kind of put the ambulance standby and left after a while. And and then that happened again at another gig in Woodland Hills, California, kind of near my house, you know, half hour drive, I hop over there and at the last minute I'm like walking out the door, they're like, bring your guitar. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I go there and I play. And then it, what was interesting was that night I was doing a, a or maybe the next night I was doing a, um, a cool judging a contest, you know, Guitar Center's King of the Blues, the grand finale, Joe Bonamassa was hosting. Uh, I was uh, up there with Leo Nocentelli and Tony Maiden who played Maggot Brain and Mindy Abair, the sax player, were the judges for this contest. And I'm like, hey, Slick, man, why don't you come down to this thing? You get the night off here in L.A. It'll be fun. It's at the Nokia Theater downtown. You know, it's like, cool. Dr. John is playing. And he's like, no, man, I think I'm, I'm going to lay low tonight. Well, it turns out that he had been having a major liver ailment. And the good news is that he ended up getting a complete liver replacement, which is really hard to do. Yeah. He had a liver transplant, and he's alive and well. And but that was three years ago. And they called me up three days after that gig and said, "Hey, Slick just said he can't do this next tour. Do you want to go to Israel and Italy and some American dates?" I'm like, "I don't know. I got a full time job at Musicians Institute." And I'm like, "When does it leave?" He says, "It leaves in 36 hours." <laughs> oh my like, god! Uh, I laughed at him. <laughs> but wow. I talked to them and my superiors at Musicians Institute said, you know, if you can make sure that no planes crash, so to speak, or, you know, keep everything running at uh, Musicians Institute while you're gone. Hmm. So I did a two week tour and it was fantastic. And then they're like, we have a five week tour and hit like 12 European countries or something 
are you in? I'm like, yeah, I really want to do that. You know, it was like Scotland, England, France, Belgium, Sweden, wow. all this stuff. And uh, but then I really ha- I had to step down, which I, I think is is good at, at Musicians Institute. Like, I don't think it's good for the one person to be the chair of the department for years and years and years. Like when I went to college at UC Berkeley, the chair would change every one or two years. It'd always be a new chair. It just seemed like a good thing. And there's a, I had a great replacement, Stieg Matheson from Norway. He's just a virtuoso guitarist, and he's got like a doctorate in guitar from USC. <laughs> it's an amazing cat. Wow, wow. He's at MI right now, and he's a really interesting dude. And um, I've just been touring, and of course, I keep a title at Guitar Player Magazine, or contribute a couple things a month, and represent the magazine here in LA. I'm the Los Angeles editor, and huh. just finished the Kirk Fletcher chords thing that I showed you this morning. So, you know, do cover stories here and there. Cool. Ones would be like Slash and Joe Bonamassa, a couple other ones, John Petrucci, wow. um, Zach Wilde covers, whatever I can, however I can help, you know, to me writing is kind of like making music, like it's like get the same kind of satisfaction. They're both very lonely pursuits. You sit there practicing for hours by yourself or you sit there yeah. writing a paper, you're basically writing something it's, it's true. for hours I, and days. And I, you know, it's it's some for me I mean, it's, it sounds ridiculous because it's so hard for me to find the time to write one column a month you yeah. know but I mean this this guy's just doing six different things at once for the magazine <laughs> plus playing it's like yeah, I, I, you know, touring I, touring yeah it's feeling like a slacker right now you know <laughs> well yeah. you do this podcast oh wow, that's good yeah, we have the podcast yeah, we have the podcast yeah oh this is this is so cool so I'm I gotta, hanging out talking to this. I gotta ask you a question about John Petrucci because I've been seeing some videos of him lately um, what is up with that beard? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> that, That's what all the kids are wearing. Yeah, but that beard. I mean, he looks like Santa Claus got his hair dyed black. <laughs> yeah, he, he looks pretty brutal. I kind of like it. Yeah, oh he's got, he's, I see it. And I go, whoa! What in the hell happened? To him? You know why? <laughs> because he can. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, he can. Cool like face. I said, John Petrucci could fart on an album and sell you know ten thousand mm. copies. I could. I could start now and. <laughs> 12, 15 years, I'd probably be halfway there. Yeah, I was going to say, everything he does, he does perfect <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and in excess. That's in the extreme. That's right. That's right. <laughs> He's great. He's, I've interviewed him a few times. He's just such a cool cat and so clear-headed and knows yeah. exactly what he's doing and and so welcoming backstage or whatever. And like, nice. I yeah, got to hang out with him and check out his, his practice. His backstage practice rig is like so cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like a Mesa Boogie tube amp with a little rack and some drawers and pedals and everything. They That's roll into. Cool. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah what a great guy. And, he, and seems, he, knows, he seems like a very down to earth guy. Yeah. You know? He should, he should take that practice rig and just market it as the Mini Petrucci. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. Everything, one little pack of the Mini Petrucci. <laughs> well, I saw I saw his rig run down. He goes, yeah, I've really downsized from what yeah. I used to carry. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, there's two racks, and there's, you know, but now it's all like 112s and stuff. They, You know, he's got surrounding him, basically. Well, see, one, the front oh. just, the one is just, you know, the front opens, it's a big refrigerator. <laughs> you know, it's actually a refrigerator. You know? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I've seen some amazing rigs. I tell you, I interviewed Peter Frampton. Like that was, that rig was like a city. You know, <laughs> he's got the three cabinets dry in the middle and the stereo on the outside. He's got the talk box. He's got the near in ear mics. He's got the remote Dunlop wah rack mount control mm-hmm, with yeah. the remote pedals in the very back of the stage. And then in a case, you know, he's got that old Ampeg that he's been playing for a million years, and it's like a microphone inside an anvil case mm-hmm. like 30 feet back from the front of the stage wow and and then he's got uh what did i see uh like a couple of leslie's and a couple of deluxe reverbs <laughs> yes yeah, and he sounds fucking great i mean yeah. like it sounds amazing Peter yeah. Frampton, I, I, it's a crazy rig two of the biggest rigs i ever saw that i got to see up close and personal uh john sykes mm-hmm. uh when he was in uh, blue when he did blue murder okay uh and uh uh Steve Lukather from Toto mm-hmm. when he was out with them. Now Steve's rig was stereo. Sykes's rig, I think it might have been stereo too, where they had two four twelves kind of like wedged behind him mm-hmm. and you know, pointing up. Both mm-hmm. of those guys. But I remember the guy for Sykes. Oh, I'm sorry, both guys. Their roadies actually had a uh, uh, like a uh, uh, like a director sheet of the music and 
they controlled everything. A lot of a lot of the you know yeah. their techs do a lot of the like switching. Like the wah and everything. I was mm-hmm. like, man, that's crazy. It's a lot of trust. <laughs> it, it is a lot of trust. You really got to trust your tech, you know. And yeah. it was all big Bradshaw stuff. You oh, know, yeah. this was yeah. back in the day. Now, you know, it's not as much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think about stereo rigs? Because you know, we hear with two ears, and whenever I hear a really good stereo rig. I'm, I just love it so much. It's like I would say there's a few of them, like Reverend Horton Heat. I think he runs like he runs the, the echo out of one amp and the dry out of the other. Mm-hmm. I just saw one, one of the best shows I've ever seen, best guitar performances, was Mike Landau the other night at the Baked Potato. If you ever get a chance and you're in L.A. and he's playing, oh, he's get amazing. a ticket yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and yeah. get there early. See if you can get the chair. I'm not kidding. Right in front of his amp. It's not bad loud. It's good loud, and it's so stereophonic. He's well, he plays. Two- he plays two amps. He he plays uh, the um, uh, the Hot Rod Deluxe or the Blues Deluxe or something. They actually have one now that's a Landau model. Really? Yeah, and yeah. it's just a clean channel. It's not the overdrive channel. Huh. He, and um, the other one is a Deluxe Reverb. Get out of town. Yeah. No, he yeah. plays those two. Yeah. Uh, we we had seen him at uh, at Ramshead on stage mm. with um, um, who do we see him with? Uh, Robin Ford. Oh. Um, and oh my god yeah, his yeah. tone we were on his side of the stage his tone was just to freaking die for yeah man it, it sounds I mean it's so dimensional and he totally makes it work you know mm-hmm. I just love it I another guy who gets a great stereo tone is Jamie Kime he's playing with um, Dr. John now he plays every Monday night when he's in town at the Monday Night Jam at the Potato he's also played with Zappa plays Zappa he gets a killer stereo tone Thing. Excuse me. He's he's using one of those Fryette things, the power station, oh, yeah. where you can mix different amps together really easily. Or you could take like I want to do this. I want to get that power station. I want to try your two watt head, which looks really cool. I've never heard it. That E stamp. It's awesome. And, yeah, it is. And <laughs> and then you can you run that through this thing, and you can run. Of course, you can run that power tube grind through your effects. Have that come out of a separate amp. Mm-hmm. Huh. So you're getting the tube grind that you, it's like being in a recording studio where you get the great amp tone and then as needed, you add a little effects later. Right, wow, right. That's cool. Yeah, uh, Bradshaw used to do that back in the day. He used to, the little 12 watt solid state Marshall heads that used to come on the little mm-hmm. mini stack. Yeah, yeah. That Marshall head used to be on the top of a lot of his racks that he built. Oh, no lie. And, and yeah, and he would come out of that and you know would get the tone from there and then process the shit out of it. Oh, wow! Yeah. Yeah. So you know, you're onto yeah, something, Jude. You know who has a good <laughs> stereo rig is uh, Steve Morris, dry yeah. and wet. Mm-hmm. And then of course his is all through the Ernie Ball pedals. Yeah, he's got uh, a few of those that you can control. Yeah. You know, like he brings it in signals to delay, and then you can you know you can back it off, and the delay still has a long tail on yeah, it. And, yeah, yeah, man, he, it's, that, that it's thing is. You bring a, in the drive with one. And, that is a trunk of oh cables. Oh my god! Yeah, that's that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. So Jude, of uh, of uh, what are you playing now? What do you what, what's your rig in Starship? You know, it's always changing. It's all backline first of all, so it could be anything from a. Fender Twins. I, I kind of like, it's kind of like for the old stuff, for the airplane stuff, which we do a lot of, I wish I had all Fender amps, but then for the more rocking stuff, like Ride the Tiger and Jane, then we want that more of a Craig Chikiso kind of a sound. I, I want like a 4x12, so mm-hmm. I'd say most of the time I get a 4x12, either some kind of Mesa rig or a, um, or a Marshall, even JCM series. It's just whatever's available. I bring some pedals just in case, like you know, some overdrive pedals, okay. OCD from a full tone, mm-hmm. yep. full tone fat boost, exotic EP booster, maybe. I always bring this Terra Echo from Boss. I really love it. I brought it here to show you guys. Like if you hit it, if you hit a note and you hold it, it's got a really angelic sound. Wow. I just really love it. Does some weird stuff. That's like I bring that little echo pedal. I, there's some great Dunlop stuff, like the uh, the uh, their analog pedal. Oh man, what's it called? The green one. The analog uh, uh, it's delay a, pedal. Yeah, it's called the. the um, <laughs> it's a Dunlop delay pedal. Uh, yeah, it's the familiar. analog one though. Analog it, delay. Is it called I, analog delay? Yeah. No, and a carbon it's copy. Got, oh, the carbon it's copy. Got, it's carbon copy. Yeah, yeah. it's got a cool. It's, cool it's, it's got a little modulation on it, like a tape warble. It's got a little button that you can yeah, push, yeah, yeah, and you get the tape warble. I should know. I've got one of those in my pedal board. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I you know what's funny about my first real guitar after that harmony which i destroyed i got a um 10 year old strat it was a fender strat and i was really shy when i went to buy it because i was like 13 years old and i brought my adult guitar player friend who was really good and to make sure it was good it was like 350 dollars. it was a 72 strat later i opened it up and the pickup said 1974 so i don't know maybe it's a 74 three bolts mm. you know Three bolt micro tilt. Micro tilt, yeah. But I was really excited to get home and just play and be able to try doing stuff that like the Hendrix and the Van Halen and stuff like that with the bar. And I get it home, and I'm like scratching my head and rubbing my eyes, but I, I there's nowhere to put a bar in. Oh no! And I realize it's a hard it's tail. It's a hard tail. <laughs> like this oh, guy, no. not only was it maybe a '74 when he said it was a '72, he didn't mention that it was a hard tail Strat. Wow. Like, you know, I found that to later, at first I was annoyed by that, but now I realize that that's kind of cool because my first guitar hero is Nile Rodgers and his number one guitar that he did all those songs on, the hit maker, mm -hmm. was a hard tail strap, yep. just like mine. Yep. Wow. So that's kind of, turned out to be kind of cool. So I, I still have that guitar, even though it doesn't really have the sparkle of a regular strat, nor does it have the tremolo. Yeah. So, right. Now you can do all the Robert Cray stuff too, because he uses hard tail. Hard tail. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah you know, at least at least you know. And you're he holding... has chieftains. <laughs> uh, matchless chieftains, yeah. That's right. Yes, yeah, a pair of them. Yeah, a pair yeah. of them. And <laughs> goddamn, they're loud. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the Riveras, or would you say the, 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 he's matchless. got matchless chieftains? Yeah, because uh, my chieftain is not loud. <laughs> really? Oh, really? It's got a sweet spot. I mean, it's loud. It's like thirty watts, but mm -hmm. I've definitely played louder thirty watt amps. Hmm. Like it's got that sweet spot. But the second that you're in a band where the drummer is extra loud or the there's a lot of stuff on stage or you don't have monitors it yeah it doesn't really keep up all the way which is okay it's just a really sweet amp and it's just got that thing that it does see that's where my 30 watts beat the matchless yeah mine are loud yeah <laughs> well when i when yeah. i saw robert i was really close mm -hmm. uh yeah, and there's and, a pair of them too, and that makes a difference. Well, he had he had three oh. amps. He had a, uh, a Vibro King in the middle. Oh, and he okay. had the two Chieftains on the side. And I was like, "Wow, that's a lot of rack gear that sound like you're plugged straight in, absolutely clean." <laughs> and I was watching, and I was like, "Man, that's actually going through some stuff, but it still sounds like it's just plugged straight in." Yeah, so he's was, got a remarkable tone. He really. Oh does. my God, that guy is. Uh, I can't. He sings and he plays and mm -hmm. he's just really good at everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah you know so. you're gonna be a blues player i really think it's great if you can sing i mean it's hard to be a true blues player and not be able to match your playing with your voice you know? that's that's for sure my uh my my good friend linwood uh told me that he learned years decades and decades ago when he first started to go to blues jams and you know it was learned how to playing sing guitar yep he's going you know if you know how to sing you get to stay up a lot longer Sure. <laughs> it's true. It's yeah, true. Right. So, oh, you could sing. Yeah, stay. Yeah, just sing another one. Yeah. <laughs> That's too yeah. cool. Well, Jude, uh, anything else uh, we need to touch on? Of any, any? Are, are you an endorser of anything? Any signature gear? Any, uh, any CDs, DVDs coming out? Anything that you want to let the public know about? Oh man, thanks. Well, you know, I, I have a, a site. JudeGold.com, just J U D E G O L D.com. Mm -hmm. There's always enough stuff going on there. Lots of shows coming up all over the country this summer with Jefferson Starship, you know, East cool. Coast and also Dallas and Colorado and stuff, Mississippi starting in a couple of weeks. Well, we'll have to uh, we'll have to try to catch up with you if you're on the East Coast yeah. uh, around us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we'll uh, your website will be on your show, it'll be a link there. And it will live in perpetuity. Yes. In the archives. <laughs> once the show goes, you know, it stays on the front page for a week and then it goes into the archives, but it's there forever. And oh, that's uh, cool. so people can click through that, go out there and give him some love and Absolutely. check out all the stuff. And yeah, say, say hi on Facebook if you want to. Um, I have a Facebook music page. Just search for that, or, you know, cool. And to answer your question, I don't really have any official endorsements, but I do, you know, have friends. I was being in working for magazine stuff. It wouldn't really be right to sign up with That's one true. company. Every day, but but so like since I was 13, Diodario has been amazing to me. I remember I wrote them a letter once and they sent me a bunch of swag and a t-shirt and then they give me strings. I, I love Diodario and nice. Mesa Boogie, Sur guitars, you know, I don't oh, know yeah. how many 
Check out Sir Gray California guitars. A lot of them are kind of Fender inspired. Yep. Mm-hmm. S U H R M J yep. guitars. Well, check this out. One last thing you got here. I'm always telling people to check out capos. What does a capo do? It moves the bridge up basically, so mm-hmm. the strings are higher. Well, what about? I like baritones. Here's an M J. M J guitars made me all these cool baritone or. Oh, that's cool, man. That's so I love mean it. sounding, man. I just love playing Barry. So I always is... recommend uh, checking out some baritones, and, and MJ makes great baritones. They also make other guitars. And, nice. And so, yeah. Those are my friends, you know. Those Shout are... out for MJ. Excellent. I guess, I guess if Jude got like an endorsement, the guys at, at Guitar Player would be like, um, why do we have 35 Sir Guitar ads running this month? <laughs> <laughs> And hey, hey, uh, and they haven't paid anything. What's going? On? You know, if John wants to pay for thirty-five ads, he can. You know, that's not a problem. It's, not a problem. it's just it's just so nice that you guys have me on here because you know there's just I mean, there's living in L.A. There's so many phenomenal guitar players like within three blocks of me, let alone three miles. If you ever you should get you should come to Musicians Institute. It's just a magical place. You know, Scott Henderson's there a lot Mondays and Tuesdays when he's not on the road yet. Carl Verheyen, who's been on your podcast, he teaches yeah, there on Thursdays. Yeah, yeah, I love Carl. And these these players are so sick, and they're so they're just you know just veterans, man. And they yep. played a million gigs and sessions and all over the world. Sid Jacobs, monster jazz player. Dan Gilbert, one of the best teachers I've ever seen. Wow! I invite you to come check it out. Yeah, man. Well, here's the funny part. I was showing Jeff the numbers the other day. We live in Maryland. And California beats Maryland's numbers as far as downloads. For yeah. downloads for our show. Yeah, so <laughs> oh, interesting. A lot, cool. lot of guys are listening. A lot there, of guys so out there good. are listening. So we thank you for yes. that. Yeah, yes. thank you very much. And uh, you know, hopefully, we, if we get out there someday, we'll be able to hook up. And uh, yeah, it's just so cool that you know, if, we'll have if to people, you know, players can go to MI and just actually interface with all these incredible people that have all, you know, not only just are super talented, yeah. but just have so much experience that they can impart and, to you. And, and that's priceless. And the know? other side of that is too, is that it's set up perfect for guys who can't afford to go to, you know, Berkeley or, or, you know, any of the other colleges that they're going to come out with a hundred grand mm-hmm. or plus of a bill. They can, you know, go yep. there and, you know, you're thrown into the, I mean, it's a shark pole, man. It's, you know, you've had guys walk through there like Paul Gilbert and Marty Friedman and Jason Becker and, you oh, know, man. those cats are, that's crazy. you know, that's insane just, stuff. Just to be around them, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Richie Kotzen gets off the plane and the first person he meets is Jason Becker. Right. I mean, think about that. And then they become like friends and they're like hanging out and stuff. It's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, but that's what you get when you go there. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There's a scary amount up here. It's funny you should mention Paul Gilbert. That guy is so cool. He doesn't need to teach at MI anymore, but he still likes to come through every once in a while. He's like, he call up, he's like, hey, man, I want to teach three weeks of private lessons. Can you get me much students? He just likes to talk to the students. <laughs> yeah, they're lined up outside the door down the oh, yeah, block yeah. and everything else. For sure. <laughs> you know what? You know what's interesting? Like situation. You literally draw tickets, and if you if you uh, get chosen, you get to choose a slot with Paul Gilbert. Wow. wow. That's nice. Well, you know, I saw I saw. There's a bunch of videos of Paul Gilbert. You know, and he does like an in store thing over in England, and the entire thing is not just him up there jamming. It's him explaining this blues thing that he got hooked on. And I'm like, the guy it just wants to give all the information out, mm-hmm. you know. He and he's got this online thing now that he does, uh, but where you submit a video to him, he'll actually watch it and then send you a video back and tell you what you may oh, need to work on and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's really cool how that cat is, man. <laughs> okay, you know what? I'm never going to send him a video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be me. It, uh, yeah, you yeah. need to work on uh, accounting. Piano. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jude, yeah. thanks so much, man. Yeah, thanks man. so much for taking the time. I know we took a lot of your time, but thank you so much for uh, for agreeing to be on with us. It was great. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, man, pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's all good. It's all good. And uh, we'll let you know as soon as it's up, and you can uh, you can share it with all your virtual friends and family. Yes. And, uh, you know, 
give everybody <laughs> oh, a little should... insight onto the uh, you know the, the inner workings of, of Jude Gold. You know? Absolutely, I can definitely guarantee you that at least my mom will listen to it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> hey, you know, every download helps. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yeah, my mom it's, doesn't it's, even it. listen to the show. <laughs> Yeah, well, my, my pleasure. I definitely will share it, and uh, I really appreciate being on it. Very cool. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Have yeah. a great rest of the evening, uh, a, a great week, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we can catch up with you when you guys hit the East Coast, man. We'd yeah. love to. Yeah, thanks. So I'll definitely, I'll probably see you before you, yeah, before you guys get out here. I'll probably be out there. So I can't wait to see you guys. It'll be fun. Sounds like a plan, cool, man. man. Thank you All so right. much. Take care. Sweet. Cheers. Have a good one. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> Well, and there you have the story. Yeah, man. It's, uh, <clears throat> wow, quite, uh, quite diverse musically. Wow. It's, it, 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 it's just, <laughs> uh, again, you know, the whole say yes thing comes up, yeah. but it's like, uh, just to be offered so many different opportunities in different genres. Yeah. Uh, you know, because you figure, you know, you're playing rock and somebody comes up and offers you a better rock gig mm -hmm. you know yeah but but you, you know you're playing the the garcia stuff and this is after you know doing a a prog band with your friends you know and then you you get out and do the the, the jx3 thing you know with the bx the uh, bx3 B BX3, yeah bx3 yes. uh <laughs> yes. you know with a couple different kinds of styles there yeah you know and and then how that winds up in Starship, I, I have no idea. But it's you know, it's again, it's it's just the um, of you know, people who know people who know yeah. people. It's all about networking. You and know? and here's the thing too that I've noticed, and uh, we've now you know we've got a bunch of shows in the bag here. We've talked to a ton of people. Um, there's no excuse for uh guitar players that are dedicated and that will uh you know bust their hump to not have jobs because mm -hmm. these guys are constantly working but they also have their head down and they're going right you know and like he's like you said you know yes they 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 just adapt and and keep moving mm -hmm. and that right there shows you that yeah, you know, the three guys that you may be playing with, it may not be the thing that you're not going to be the next, uh, it, it could be anything, you know, uh, whatever, Alter Bridge or something like that. But if you take your talent and you start putting yourself out there, work will come to you <laughs> if you just get along, you agree, and you just keep moving, man. I mean, look at, look at some of these guys that we talk to, how they are just getting right. picked well, up all I mean, the time. You know the to, for him to um, in the middle of all that be asked to be a, a, a director at, at MIT. At MIT, you yeah. know, at, and he's at working MI, a guitar, you know. yeah, working a guitar player and stuff. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, you know, it's not. I guess the thing is, and a lot of kids they don't know this, and maybe we have some kids that are listening to the show. Uh, it, it's it, you know you you got to just kind of do those things. You got to go through with the motions and all. Don't think that. You know, because in the day, man, I'm telling you, today, it's almost impossible to get a band that's going to do something crazy, mm -hmm. you know, because there's not really like a radio or the, uh, you know, a record company that can really push you anymore. Right. Unless you're in some kind of pop thing, you know, but it, these guys here, they, you even see what that's, they're doing. Even that most of the time is just put together, you know, there are, I mean, there are some Might bands. Might not even be guitar There players. are some <laughs> bands that still do make it as a band. Yes. But, you know, that's probably i mean it's nowhere near what it used to be exactly uh but it's it, there's probably less of an opportunity to do that than to just go and find your way as a as an individual musician you know yeah. and you may wind up um you know with, with with some great guys but you know you have to look at out other opportunities outside just a band unit uh if you really want to move forward you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. uh, you know, and everybody, everybody in the, in your quote unquote band unit, you know, whenever that starts to come mm -hmm. together should realize that at this point in this day and age, it's like, it's really, really hard to make it as a quote unquote band. So if anybody else gets opportunities, you know, a, yeah. a, a decent opportunity, we all expect you to take it. 
Yeah, you know? we know guys. We definitely know guys that are local here that play in eight different bands. Oh yeah, you yeah. know that's their job. That's what they do. They got their little map, you know, their calendar, and they're doing their thing. And uh, I, Dave, I, Dave Demarco is one of the ones that I think of. And he'll he'll get a call and he'll be like, "Hey, uh, we need a bass for this album." So he'll get all the stuff. He'll do the parts, mm -hmm. ship it off, just like Mister Jason Sedidis. Right. Right. You know. Right. So many many stuff. different ways to make it in the music yeah. industry. You know, just not so much the, tr the traditional band. I way. guess I guess what I should have said is just keep your mind open. Right. Don't you know? Don't go down with the ship. <laughs> if you're looking to make a music career, keep that you know much broader strokes. I guess. Yes. Yes. You know. And it doesn't hurt if you're like Jude and play a very unusual style. Yeah. Because you know, then uh, it's like, oh yeah, we want that over here. You know, we exactly use that over here. Would you like to do that over here? Mm -hmm. You know, so, yeah. you know, find your own bag and just say yes. That's right. That's it. So until next time, my friend. You coming back? I don't know. Because I'll be here. <laughs> I'll be here. I'll be here waiting. I don't know if I'll pass out or not. <laughs> I am Mick Marcelino. <laughs> About to pass out. You are. I'm still Jeff Bober and I'm not far behind. And we are saying. Onward. Be sure and follow the show on Twitter, at Amps and Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook. For news, comments, and everything else, visit the webpage, ampsandaxiscast.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.